Happy Sabbath, church family. It's a blessing to be with you once more. It's been a while since I've been here, actually. Uh, we're away at big camp, uh, looking after the junior division during the uh, month of January. And uh, we had a blessed time there. We, had, uh, we were running the junior division, and we had over 20 kids in some way give their heart to the Lord. So uh, it was always a blessing. It's always a challenge, but it's always always worth it and kind of really alludes to what we're going to be talking about this morning in regards to service. Uh, we're into our third week this morning of our four-part series here at Hamilton Central Influence. And our message today is looking at serving others. This is uh, our series, Influence, that is promoting our vision as a church. And uh, you've heard it a couple of times now, so what is that vision? Anyone out there? Shout it out. Use your best evangelistic voice. A positive. Um, I'll put it up there and make it a bit easier for you, eh? Let's just... Uh, is that plugged in, Yuri? It is? Right, there we go. All right, so let's say it together, eh? To be a major Christian influence... In Hamilton. That is, that is what we're here for, amen? That is what we're here as God's church, to be a major Christian influence here in Hamilton. And we're going through this process of looking at these parts of our vision. And it's very much sequential, isn't it? Have you picked up on that? It's very much sequential. And uh, our first one, obviously, that is absolutely paramount for us to have influence is what? Do you remember what the first message that Pastor Josh shared with us was about? I think I heard it out there, connecting to, connecting to Christ, wasn't it? Connecting to Christ. So this, again, is the absolute cornerstone. This is, this is the foundation of both our vision and uh, the ability for us to have any kind of influence uh, in our sphere of influence, both as individuals and as the church. If we're not connected to Christ, then uh, we're going to have little to no positive influence uh, in this city. Without Christ, we're essentially dead in the water, aren't we? Without Him, we don't have a vision. Without Him, our plans perish. And uh, Pastor Josh shared with us Proverbs 29, 18. And in that first message, I like how the ESV puts it. It says it this way, Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. It's important for us to see that we're not just talking about plans in general, but very specifically, God's plan. Amen? God's got a plan for us as his church living in these last days. And he's saying that if the church fails to include Jesus in their plans, then that church is planning to fail. If we fail to include Jesus in our plans, then we are planning on failing. That's what it means there when it talks about prophetic vision. And, you know, when we talk about prophecy, we aren't always necessarily talking about knowing the future. Essentially, prophecy just means divine revelation. Prophetic vision is simply divine revelation. When we pray to God to inspire, to inspire us to share the plans that he has for us, again, as individuals and as his church, this is prophetic vision. This is why we pray, isn't it? We pray that he inspires us through his Holy Spirit so that we can know his will. Amen. And God reveals himself to us when we are connected to Christ. And when we're not, then what we're doing is essentially, as it says there, casting off this restraint. Now, we hear this word restraint, and it might sound uh, somewhat restrictive, right? But when you think of this kind of restraint, think of yourself as a toddler traveling in a car in a baby seat. That's a positive restraint, isn't it? It's keeping us safe. It's protecting us. It's a, it's a good thing. And of course, this protection comes via our connection with Christ. And the means of that connection, this passage tells us uh, it's by way of keeping the law. And back in this time, uh, the scriptures uh, was the law of Moses, the first five books uh, of the Bible. This is all they had. This is their authority for their time. 
Uh, for us today, it's not just about being uh, a commandment keeper, uh, because we have the entirety of Scripture as our authority, don't we? It's not just about those five books. It's uh, about all 66, uh, particularly what we see in the Gospels and the life of Jesus. God's Word is what guides us. It's what keeps us safe. It is what connects us to Jesus. And we can be sure that our efforts in His name will be blessed. Again, He is the most important part of this whole equation because when we are connected to Him, we have a much higher probability of things working out. Because when we are connected to Christ, what kind of influence are we going to be? A major influence. Where? Where? And Okay. We are going to be a major influence here in Hamilton. And when we are connected to Christ, we find that we have a love for people that is much different than the one that we have without His influence. Without His influence, the love that we have is uh, a lot more conditional, isn't it? But God's love, of course, is unconditional. It's this agape love that uh, allows us to love others that we might not necessarily otherwise love. And, you know, that is so important for us as the church this morning because the reality is that when you look around this church this morning, have a look around. Have a look around this church this morning. What do you see? A whole lot of people looking back at you, right? <laughs> but what you see is a, a diverse group of people, diverse in so many different ways. And the only way that a group this diverse can operate harmoniously as the body of Christ is when we're all connected to Him. When we all have the same love for each other that He has for us, this unconditional, this uncomp uncompromising, perfect love. Because when we have that kind of love, then he can do great things. Amen? Amen? He can use us powerfully, again, both as individuals and as his church. Pastor Josh shared with us last week this verse from the Gospel of John. Such a, a powerful verse. Is it there? There, your love. Your, your love for one another will prove to the world that what? You are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Such a powerful verse. You know, Josh mentioned last week about this religious survey that was done here in New Zealand recently. And uh, though the older generations in New Zealand tend to see Christians in the church in a, in a relatively positive light, uh, it's a very different story for Generation X and those that succeeded. The top feeling when it came to these groups was what? About the church and about Christians, that they are... Do you remember? Thank you, Josh. Judgmental. That was the big thing, that they, they thought the church and Christians in general were judgmental. And, you know, we can understand why, can't we? When we look at the, the history of the church, you know, there's been a lot of stuff done in the name of Jesus uh, that are, are very unchristlike, very unfortunate. And, you know, sadly, these things continue to be done as well. But this verse here gives us hope, doesn't it? It gives us hope because if we can love like Jesus, it will prove to the world that not only is a true Christian non judgmental, but that we are some of the most considerate, mindful, and loving people that you could ever meet. And the church didn't say amen? You want to say amen to that? Amen. amen. Because when we have a love like Christ's, we're going to have what kind of influence? A major influence. And where are we going to have that major influence? Here in Hamilton. I think they're starting to get it, Josh. Does it sound like it? Yeah, a little bit. A little, little ways to go yet, I think. But how will people see that love? How are they going to see that love? Well, that brings us to our, our third part this morning, to serve others. That's what the impetus of our message is going to be about this morning, serving others. And, you know, as you would expect, the Bible has a lot to say about servanthood uh, because the central theme of the Bible is Jesus. And, of course, Jesus is the one who is servant of all. Jesus is servant of all. It says this in Mark 10, 45. 
For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to what? To serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When we give Jesus Christ his rightful place as our Lord of our lives, he will influence us to serve others as he served and continues to serve. Now, did anyone come to church today to be served? Hands up if you came to be served. I'm, I'm glad to see that. Who came to serve? Amen. Amen. That's what we want to see. You know, we should have this attitude both in the church as well as in our sphere of influence out in our communities. Look at what it says in Philippians 2 here. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as who? Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a what? Of a servant. So just as Jesus served, so are we called to serve. And you know, it shouldn't be just an obligation. We shouldn't feel like we're obliged to fulfill this. Because what does it say there? That he took the very nature of a servant. That serving was natural to him. And we want it to be natural to us as well. And that will only be natural in our own lives when we are, again, connected to Christ. And of course, what the service uh, looks like is going to be very different from saint to saint, isn't it? From person to person, we're all very different, and God has given us all different talents and gifts uh, to serve uh, both His church and those out in the world. And it says this in 1 Peter 4, uh, God has given each of you a gift from His great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God Himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you will do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to Him forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. 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 So God has equipped us with these different spiritual gifts that are designed exclusively to serve one another. To serve one another out of love because we are connected to Jesus. And what is that purpose? Why do we serve? Ultimately, to bring glory to God. Amen? To glorify our Father in heaven. Some of us might have the gift of speaking. You know, I'm praying for that gift. I'm hoping that the Lord will give it to me one day. Some of us might have the gift of helping. But whatever gift we have, God expects us to use them and to use them well in order to represent Him, to, to glorify Him. And you know, maybe this morning you have absolutely no idea what your giftings actually are. Hands up if you actually know what your gifts are. Yeah, there's a, a few of us know what our gifts are. Well, there's a lot of good resources online that can help us identify what those gifts are. And uh, the reality is that every single one of us has at least one. Amen? Every one of us has at least one gifting that we can use to serve. And uh, if you'd like any help with that, trying to find these resources or to recognize what your gifting is, then you can either see myself or, or Josh or, or one of the elders. And we'd, we'd absolutely love to help you find out what those giftings are. Because once you know what your giftings are, uh, then you can make them known to the church leadership and we can plug you in somewhere so that you can, you can use those gifts to serve. But we're not just expected to serve here, are we? We're not just expected to serve here inside the church. God expects us to serve outside the church as well. You know, the world is in desperate need of Christians that are willing to show the love of Christ through their actions. Absolutely crying out for it. And when it comes to service outside the church, you know, I think in, in the past we have depended largely on Telling people about Jesus. We have this great commission in Matthew 28 to go out and reach people with the gospel, to teach them about Jesus and to bring them in to the church. I like what it says in Mark 16, 15. 
It says this, And he said to them, Go where? Into all the world and do what? Proclaim the gospel to who? To the whole creation. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. So what does it mean to proclaim? You know, often I think we can make the mistake of thinking that proclaiming is something that we can only do through words. But to proclaim simply means to demonstrate something, yeah? And we are called to demonstrate the gospel. To demonstrate the gospel, what that looks like. To demonstrate something uh, can obviously be done through words, but it can also be done through actions. And there's a great quote that's often ascribed to uh, Francis of Assisi. Uh, but the truth is, no one's actually sure uh, where it comes from. It's one of these kind of unknown quotes. Uh, but he says this, he says, Preach the gospel, or it could have been a woman, we don't know. Preach the gospel at all times, when necessary, do what? Use words. You know, I think back to the time of this guy. Who's, who's this here? Martin Luther. We all, we all know this guy. Martin Luther obviously lived, you know, in a time where the Bible was very scarce to the common person. It was only available to church leaders. Information and knowledge largely was withheld from the common people. And so when Martin Luther translated the Bible into German uh, so the common man could read and study it, there was this huge hunger for Scripture. There was a huge thirst for, for righteousness. And in his time, the word was really coveted, wasn't it, by the world. It was really, really treasured. The common man had access to all this amazing, transformative information about the gospel, about righteousness by faith. And, uh, of course, when we look at the Protestant Reformation over the years, we see Scripture being translated into almost every language. And, uh, of course, now not only do we have it in our language, but we have like a hundred different versions of it too, don't we? And you can literally access it anywhere at any time. You know, the, word, the world is now saturated in God's Word. And as a consequence, you know, people just aren't as drawn to it as they once were. And it reminds me of when I was growing up, and even today, having, having a young daughter, you know, there was, there was something special about having fruit salad at breakfast time. Who has fruit salad for breakfast? Anyone? Only a few of us? All right. So can you tell me, what is, what is the unique thing about a can of fruit salad? The cherry. The cherry. Lionel cracked it like that. That's it. The cherry. <laughs> And everyone always wants the cherry, eh? Everyone always wants the cherry. And why is that? Because there's only like one or two. We actually get um, the Pam's ones, I think, and their quality control isn't very good. So sometimes you'll get four, and then sometimes you'll get none. Uh, Evie loves it when she gets four, but yeah, she hates it when she gets none, obviously. But everyone wants to have that cherry. And why? Because it's scarce, isn't it? It's the scarce commodity at the, the breakfast table. But, you know, if we gave people the option of fruit salad or cherries, what would people go for? Yeah, no one's going to pour a whole can of cherries on their breakfast, are they? It's interesting. You know, there's, when there's an abundance of something, people just aren't really that interested, are they? And, you know, it reminds me that we are, uh, as a church, experiencing the biggest communication shift in 500 years. You know, today we are living in this information age where there is just so much information is available to everyone, everywhere, all of the time, that quite frankly, people don't want to hear about Jesus. It's sad, but true. You know, if they want to find out about Jesus, then they're going to do that on their own terms and by their own means. So proclaiming the gospel is more and more difficult. So we have to change tactic as a church when it comes to fulfilling that great commission that we find in Matthew 28. And so serving our community has to look very different than it has in the past. Now, I don't mean this morning that the sharing of Bible truth is not important. It's important, amen? Amen. It is important for us to share the truths of God's word, but we have to see that like our vision, it is part of a process. 
that it is, it is sequential. And um, I love what Teddy Roosevelt, the president, said, because this is very much how um, you know, the world thinks today. Is nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. It's so true, isn't it? No one cares how much knowledge we've got, these truths that we have, until they actually know that we do care about them. And, you know, there is a a negative perception uh, that we have to break in order for us to be influential in Hamilton. We don't want to be known as judgmental. We want to be known as compassionate, as caring, as as loving. Amen? Amen. That's what we want to be known for. And, you know, sometimes I think as a church we can put too much emphasis on protection rather than projection. We put too much emphasis on protection rather than projection. And I'll speak more about that another time. But how do we make sure that we are projecting the true character of Christ into our communities? In the book, The Ministry of Healing, uh, we are given not only a method, but the only method. The only method when it comes to serving our community. And it tells us this, Christ's method alone will give success, true success, in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then he invited them, follow me. Can you see that sequence there and how, how Christ's method works? You know, to really change perceptions in our community and to really have a a major influence in Hamilton, we first have to actually be out there mingling in our communities. Yeah? We can no longer just advertise something and expect people to come to us. We have to be out there on the front lines, don't we? Sometimes we get distracted, don't we? You're still distracted, obviously. (laughs) But I'll say it again. You know, we can no longer just advertise something and expect people to come to us. We have to be out there on the front lines with a genuine desire. It has to be part of our nature to have a genuine desire to do good, to show compassion, to find out what the needs are out there, and then to minister to them. And by doing these things, then we'll win the confidence of the community. We win their trust. And then we have a better opportunity to share the amazing story of Jesus with them. You know, the author of this book, Ministry of Healing, she goes on to say that the the strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. The strongest argument. You know, apologetics are all good. Prophecy is all good. But the most compelling argument for Jesus is for someone that is just like him to be out there representing him. Jesus says, if you truly know me, if you truly have a relationship with me, you will be someone who serves sacrificially. 1 John 3, 16 to 18. It says this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? It doesn't, does it? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Let me read that again. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. In truth, be doers of the word and not just what? Hearers of the word. You know, as one of my uh, favorite Maori creatives would say, less hui and more doey. Yeah? Less hui and more doey. He also says, be a koha and not a hoha. I love that too. Now, when we're talking about laying down our lives here, it's not talking about us giving up our lives in the sense that Jesus gave up his life. You know, this is... Uh, A a possibility, of course, uh, but it is very much the exception and not the rule. 
Thomas Scott, great theologian and Bible commentator, he, he said that it's not so much about laying down as it is laying aside. It's not about laying down, it's about laying aside. So the laying aside of something, whether that be money or, or time, something that is sacrificial to, to service. And Jesus says that the righteous at the end of time will be characterized by their service for others as if they were serving him. That the righteous, who's counted amongst the righteous here this morning? Oh, there's only a few of us. And I have a lot of, a lot of free land up in heaven there sprawling acreage beside my mansion. Now, I hope you're all there, and I'm sure you're all, you're all part of, of the righteous. But this is, is, this is what it says, that the righteous will be characterized by their service for others as if they were serving him. And we find that, of course, in Matthew 25, verses 35 and 36, where Jesus says this, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. The second greatest commandment that Jesus gave us was to love others. You know, and not just to have love for humanity in general, uh, but for us to go out of our way for individuals. To look out for the, the marginalized of society. To love the people who others may not necessarily want to love. And uh, C.S. Lewis said something that's quite con confronting, but it's very true. And, and I'll share that with you. He said this, It's easier to be enthusiastic about humanity with a, a capital H than it is to love individual men and women, especially those who are uninteresting, exasperating, depraved, or otherwise unattractive. Loving everybody in general may be an excuse for loving nobody in particular. Isn't that a powerful passage? <laughs> when I read that, it's just like, oh, man, hit me. But when we are connected to Christ, we will have a love for others that will manifest itself in this sacrificial service. And if we follow Christ's method, we're going to be what kind of influence? I made, man, it's still, it's still a bit quiet on it, Josh. Hey. What was it? What kind of influence? Major. A major influence where? In Hamilton. Amen. That's it. And we can dispel these preconceived ideas about Christianity. You know that we aren't judgmental, that we are truly compassionate, that we are caring, that we are loving, and that we truly desire the best for our community. You know, it's really important, too, that we don't always wait on the church to facilitate uh, the serving of the community. You know, sometimes we have to go out on our own and do our own thing. Do what you can in your own sphere of influence. You know, I've got a, a friend who volunteers at a Salvation Army shop. I've got another couple of friends who visit prisons regularly. You know, these kinds of things. It may be as simple as just making more of an effort to be a good neighbor. You know, and cultivating those relationships with your neighbor. But you just have to pray about it. Ask God, you know, to bring before you opportunities that you can serve him in the context that he desires using the giftings that he has given you. But the thing is, church, you know, you do this knowing that the opportunities that he gives you aren't always going to be easy. They'll always be worth it, but they're not always going to be easy. And, um, you know, as we close this morning, I was thinking about this message earlier in the week and pondering the, the best way to demonstrate to you what this sacrificial service looks like. And um, a cousin of mine sent me a video that uh, absolutely blew me away and epitomizes what sacrificial service looks like. And I'm going to play that video for you now. Uh, but I'll just ask the deacons if they're around just to pass out some tissues. You might need them. So just weep freely, man, if you, know, if you feel touched by it. Uh, so I'll play that video now. There's many kids, nobody want to take them. Because especially the one who's going to die, nobody wants to deal with death, you know. So these kids, if you, we don't take them, 
they're going to stay in the hospital or in facility. There is no bond. There's nobody holding them, nobody talk to them. I always talk with my kids. Doesn't matter if blind or deaf, I always talk to them. Because I believe they are a human being, they have soul, they have feeling. And for, for the, the girl I have now, I mean the only communication by touching her and holding her, the only knows that somebody with her. In December 20, I was diagnosed with colon cancer and I have to go to the hospital to operate on me one day before my birthday. I was so scared. I am 62 years old. I was so petrified because I have nobody to go. I have to face the doctors. I have to go to the operation by myself. And I say, where is your family? I have, I have no family. Where is your wife? And my wife passed away. Where is your son? I said, my son handicapped. I was so scared. I felt what the kids felt. They are alone by themselves. It makes me do more for these kids because I was in their shoes. I mean, you imagine a little kid born with terminal illness and he's taken away from his mom and dad for maybe drug abuse or neglect. They traumatize, they scare it. I mean, you take you from everybody that you know to put you somewhere else. On top of that, you are sick and you have terminal illness. I believe each kid has a right to have a family, mom and dad, brother and sisters. And those kids in the system, they have nobody. It seems to be that the world has forgotten about them. Nobody speaks for them. So those kids need to somebody to take them to their house to make them have a family. I have brothers and sisters, as somebody who takes care, care of them, loves them, and tell them, I am here for you. I am, will go through this together and give them security. Because really those kids, foster kids, anytime knock at the door, they think they're gonna, they're gonna, somebody is gonna take them away. They are not secure and they need security. and need permanent home for them they can call home. We are a human being. We should help each other. Doesn't matter what kind of help, financially, spiritually, medically, any help you can help, you should help because we are a human being and we're supposed to help each other. Doesn't matter what color, what religion, what country. No, we see as a human being. Like this, we live in harmony and we'll be united, not divided. I will foster kids as long as I am healthy and provide good care for them. I mean, I consider them as my biological kids. I never, never think about them as a foster kids. And uh, it really gives me great joy when I see them laughing and see a smile in their face. Pretty inspiring, isn't it? You know, pretty, pretty challenging as well. You know, for over 20 years, Muhammad has been taking in terminally ill foster children in Los Angeles, California. Over 80 in all. Many have died. Some in his arms as well. And it takes, he takes them in knowing that this is the reality. Knowing that no one else will. This is unconditional love. No, this, is, this is the sacrificial service that Jesus expects of us. You know, every time he knows that he takes one of these kids, that ultimately they're going to break his heart. But he does it over and over. You know, Muhammad obviously is a Muslim, but you know, the Lord has sheep in many folds. Amen. And I'm reminded, you know, that in exactly a month to the day, uh, on the 15th of March, New Zealand will remember that tragedy that occurred in Christchurch. And I'm sure we're all aware of the perception of the Islamic faith that led to that absolute tragedy. But, you know, I can guarantee you that every person involved with the Los Angeles County's Department of Children and Family Services and probably even further afield in LA, when they hear that word Islam, they probably see the face of Muhammad, yeah? Muhammad, or, or as others have dubbed him, Father Teresa, He's broken down these perceptions of his faith by exemplifying what it means to have a sacrificial heart for service because of the love that he has for people. You know, may we pray that we have a sacrificial heart of service like his, that we might have the same kind of influence in our sphere of influence that he does. 
You know, I know that Muhammad may only think of, of Jesus as a prophet, but I think he's having a bigger impact in his life than he actually knows. You know, the daughter that Muhammad currently has that you saw in that video, um, he took her into care and she wasn't meant to make it to her first birthday. And I think she's eight now. All because of that love, you know, that he, that he showed her. So may we have that kind of love, that sacrificial heart of service because our connection with Jesus and may it have such a major influence that it turns the city of Hamilton upside down. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for all that you have done for us, all that you continue to do for us. And Lord, we know that you have given us great responsibilities as followers of yours, that you expect us to love each other and to love others who are out in our community, to go out there and to serve. Lord, we recognize that we have some amazing truths in our church, but we recognize that the world largely is just not interested in them and that we need this entering wedge to be able to share these amazing truths with them, that they might be able to see Jesus in us before they hear about him. So we thank you, Lord, for this series, for this vision that our church has put together that we can truly have a major impact in Hamilton. So Lord, as I pray this morning, I pray for our church, for those that may not know what their giftings are. I pray uh, that you just impress upon their hearts the importance of knowing what they are and using them to go out there to glorify you so that people have a better understanding of who you are truly, that you are this amazing, benevolent God who wants the best for his creation. So we thank you once more, Lord, and we pray these things in the name of our Savior, of our Creator, and our Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen.